Well, hello and welcome to our Jump into STEM webinar. And this webinar is focused on our challenge related to designing a healthier and energy efficient air distribution system. The presenters today are myself, Melissa Lapsa from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and Carol Marriott from Climate Craft. Jump into STEM is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy's Building Technology Office with support from Oak Ridge National Lab and the National Renewable Energy Lab. Slides. Can you see my second slide? Project leads? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, trying to go back one slide here. There we go. So, our vision is to inspire the next uh, generation of building scientists focusing on creative ideation and diversity in the building science field. The Jump into STEM program provides a gateway or on-ramp for undergraduate and graduate students to experience the research and career possibilities of studying building science. Our intent is to attract students from diverse majors and diverse backgrounds. So the Jump into STEM program is managed by Mary Hubbard from the U.S. Department of Energy, Dr. Kim Trenbath from NREL, Dahi Simba from NREL, Melissa Lapsa, and Dr. Yunjin Bay also from ORNL. We have a team of professors that are working with us to promote the program from a variety of schools. And they're offering um, our challenges in their classroom or promoting it at their universities or schools. You can find out more information at our website at jump.ideascale.com. And uh, your, hopefully your school can get involved as well. We also have an advisory panel that helps guide our program and provide outreach for the program as well. We have Dr. Moody Altamimi from Oak Ridge National Lab, Dr. Ellen Morris from the National Renewable Energy Lab, Dr. Linnea Avalone from NSF, and Dr. Desmond Stubbs from ORAU. So the goals of the program are attract students to the building sciences by fostering innovation and ideation including students representing an interdisciplinary mix of majors, women, and minorities. We team with professors from a variety of disciplines to provide a launch pad for creative building science challenges in the classroom. We want to inspire entrepreneurial cross-disciplinary collaboration on building science challenges at colleges and universities, and we want to partner with industry and STEM organizations to design and promote motivational student challenges and events. So with this slide, you can see a quick snapshot on how the Jump into STEM student competition works. Eligible students can compete for up to four paid internships at either ORNL or NREL. Again, if you go to jump.ideascale.com to view eligibility requirements and you can see the full schedule. Click on how it works at the top of the home page to view a step-by-step -step process on eligibility, building a team, ideation, and idea submission requirements. Also on the top navigation bar is a schedule for the Jump into STEM 2019-2020 competitions. Eligible students can participate in any of the three concurrent online challenges running now through to November 15th. These challenges are supported by this online webinar, ser webinar series des designed to provide insights on industry practices, market issues, and other supporting resources to help students build and generate their idea solutions. Additionally, throughout the competition, Jump into STEM will host periodic Jumpathon events to spur innovation and creative thinking. 
After the three challenges close on November 15th, the Jump into STEM team will run a judging process to select finalists and compete on January 31st, 2020 in a final event competition hosted by NREL in Golden, Colorado. During this final event competition, judges will award the 2020 Jump into STEM internship winners. Those internships are for the summer of 2020. So our first Jump into STEM challenge topic is focused on sensors and controls for residential buildings. Participating competitors interested in this challenge topic should develop a unique application that uses sensor data in residential buildings for the purpose of reducing energy maintaining or improving occupant comfort and or to provide better responsiveness to the electric grid. Strong ideas will present a proposed approach, identify the sensor data, and how the data will be used. The idea should also discuss the anticipated impact and include a tech-to-market plan for the application. The second step jump into STEM challenge topic, which we're discussing in more detail today, is to design a healthier and energy efficient air distribution system for the small commercial building setting using your local climate zone. Strong Ideas will identify a novel system for the selected climate zone and will present implementation of the solution in a hypothetical or existing building. Solutions should articulate the expected impact from the design system and also include a tech-to-market plan. So the third and last Jump into STEM challenge topic this year is focused on pushing the envelope with innovative wall retrofit designs. Students are challenged to design a residential wall retrofit product or system that can address placement or supplement of current leaky and unhealthy walls. Strong ideas will identify how the wall retrofit will work and will be inclusive of details on how to address the issues of moisture and air tightness. Additionally, this idea solution should address one or more of the following issues. Low indoor air quality, high energy costs, and our high retrofit costs. Like the other jump into STEM challenge topics, the idea solution should include a tech-to-market plan. So our final event at NREL last year enabled our finalists to put, pitch the ideas in person and network with other students, professors, industry stakeholders, and lab staff. At our three winners, uh, two of them came to NREL for their summer internship and one came to Oak Ridge. We have, won't read through all of this, but we have information on our website. Um, on, if you click on past winners where you can see what they worked on at the laboratories and also, you know, what their personal experiences were and and also some words from their mentors. Okay, and bringing up the last slide here, um, I do want to encourage you um, during the rest of the webinar to use the chat feature if you'd like to ask a question about the Jump into STEM program. And we will open up the audio at the end of the webinar. So be thinking about your questions and feel free to enter those in and then we'll, we'll open it up for questions and answers after Carol's presentation. So with that, I would like to introduce Ms. Carol Marriott from ClimateCraft. Carol is the sales and marketing leader of ClimateCraft, a manufacturer of HVAC equipment. She has over 20 years of experience in HVAC systems and energy applications. Carol holds dual bachelor's degrees in engineering science and economics from the University of Western Ontario and further earned an executive MBA from the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. 
In addition to her formal education accomplishment, she is a professional engineer, a lead accredited professional, and an ASHRAE member. As an ASHRAE member, Carol has served on multiple committees related to energy efficient mechanical systems. Additionally, she has contributed to a number of advanced energy design guides and is currently working with the committee on the advanced energy design guide for zero energy multifamily buildings. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that share her screen. Great. Can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, good morning for everyone. Um, I'm happy to do this. Thank you, Melissa, for the, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to go over several topics today. I thought it might make sense to start with some common principles of HVAC design, particularly the reason we have HVAC to begin with, which is to address the heating and cooling loads in, in our spaces. I'm also going to go over a number of common HVA sy systems today, mainly the ones that are used in, in small commercial buildings, can't cover every system today, but it'll, it'll kind of give us a start to talk about the pros and cons of each of those systems and why we might use them and what kind of issues we run into. Because as, we're, as you're looking at this challenge for designing a, a healthy and efficient air distribution system, you're going to want to understand what those challenges are, both from a building owner perspective, but also from an occupant perspective. We're going to talk a little bit about Carol. building ventilation systems. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. This is Kim Trenbath, but I just wanted to let you know that we can see the presenter mode and not the, we see the presenter screen, but we don't see the um, presentation screen. I see the d dual slide. Let's try presenting again, and let's see if it switches to the right one. Or try sharing it again. No? Okay, I'm going to move this one over here. Okay, hang on. Does that work better? Yes, that works. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, I understand how those things work, and sometimes they, they want to pick up the other screen. All right. Um, we are also going to talk about building ventilation systems. Um, being that we are talking about indoor air quality and healthier HVAC systems, we have to talk about ventilation. That's going to be a key principle to this. And then I'm going to go over some common issues. I see a number of issues in the industry from both building owners and occupants, and I think those will maybe launch some of the ideas as you're um, looking for what we can do differently. What can we do differently from um, mechanical design engineers to uh, to manufacturers, to, to researchers. So let's start by looking at some of the common principles uh, as it surrounds indoor air quality, energy, and comfort. I often like to start right at the beginning, and I want to talk about the cooling loads in the space. And they really can come from a number of different sources. They can come from the glass load. This could be from the solar load of the sun shining in through uh, a space. You know this feeling because you've sat in an, a classroom or a building and you've been in front of that hot sun and you felt that the solar radiation coming and heating you up, even though it might be the dead of winter in, in Minnesota, uh, and you've, yet you still felt quite warm from that. Um, you're, the computer that you're watching this from today has an electrical load that, that is giving off heat in the space, and that also has to be taken care of by the air conditioning system. Occupants, building occupants. Not only do we give off heat just as humans, but we also give off both sensible and latent heat. And depending on all of the ratios in your space, whether we're talking about a small commercial building or we're talking about some large um, manufacturing facilities, the ratio of sensible and latent load is also going to be important when we're talking about designing the right system for the space. If you have a lot of people in the space, such as might be in a classroom, or you have a meeting space in a small commercial office building, you're going to have to account for that latent load as well as the sensible load from the people and the equipment in the space. And those are all really going to play into account for your HVAC system and how you're going to take that into account. Not only that, but as you're talking about the occupants, we're also going to have to bring in ventilation air. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that ventilation air is important in a minute. 
we're going to have to bring in that ventilation air to make sure that we're we're offsetting some of the CO2 that's been released by the occupants, um, as well as all the other things that are released from, from people and other things in the space. Some of the other things that we need to consider, we already talked about ventilation, outdoor air pump, but temperature and humidity control, um, as well as human comfort, which really leads us back into the psychometric chart. So looking at the psychometric chart, we define when we are comfortable, or what we call thermal comfort, as kind of in this comfort zone in the middle of the psychometric chart here. We always feel comfortable if we're not too cold, too hot, too humid, too dry. And the comfort zone really is where we want to be for when we're talking about human-occupied spaces. You know the feeling if you've been in a hot and humid environment. No matter how much air you have going across you, um, you're just hot and humid and you cannot feel comfortable. Same thing happens when you're, you have enough temperature control, but you don't have humidity control, so you have that cool, damp feeling, and you're like, gosh, I just wish I could get rid of this humidity. I'd be comfortable. And so in that comfort zone, we're really talking about the balance between humidity and temperature control. And often, humidity control is actually more important than temperature control because it's probably one of the more difficult things to do and one of the more difficult things to do energy efficiently. Humans require both for optimal comfort. There are some spaces that uh, within this world we air condition or, or, or heat and cool that we don't have to worry necessarily about comfort if we're dealing with process loads and they're not human-occupied spaces. But as we're looking to things like commercial office buildings or commercial buildings, we actually want humans to be comfortable. We want them to be comfortable because depending on what that space is, we want humans to be in there, we want them to be effective at their work, or we want them to be effective at whatever they are doing in that space. And to be effective, they need to be comfortable. Indoor air quality. Our indoor air quality is affected by a number of things. It's affected by the volatile organic chemicals, VOCs. Those are things that are given off. Actually, the easiest way to explain it is to talk about that new car smell. That new car smell is VOCs being given off by by things in your vehicle that are giving off that smell. In a building, it tends to be the, the glue in the flooring that's being used. It could be in the carpet and the carpet fibers. It could be in the furniture, the wallpaper, uh, any of those wall coverings. Those all, new paint, paint gives off a, a VOC as well. When we talk about bringing in ventilation air, one of the things we're trying to do is trying to remove those VOCs from the space because humans too much of those VOCs are going to be interactive and poor for, for human comfort and, and human health. CO2 is another thing that we're going to be off-gassing with or removing from the space with ventilation air. And we're doing that because, again, humans in the, in the space are going to be giving that off. And then you have dust and debris. As you open up doors, if you have operable windows, all of that dust and debris is going to be coming in and removing it from the space, removing it from the air. Removing that particulate from the air is going to be important to the to a healthy HVAC system. So where do we know what to do with all of that? ASHRAE standard, uh, standard 62.1 is the minimum code for the amount of outdoor air or ventilation that is considered acceptable indoor air quality in the space. That is one reference to consider. There are a couple of different calculation methods that depending on the space and what's happening in the space would indicate what kind of indoor air ventilation volume you would need. There's also an indoor air quality guide that's been published, and it, it's about best practices to achieve good indoor air quality in the space. This would then go above and beyond what we would consider a minimum or meets code requirement of standard 62. Continuing on with indoor air quality, one of the other things, and this mixes both that humidity requirement as well as that, that ventilation requirement. The Sterling bar graph, pretty common to be aware of the Sterling bar graph, a lot of research done, was done by Dr. Sterling to indicate where, where the humidity needs to be in the space in order to minimize any kind of growth. If the humidity is too high, certain fungi and certain mites are going to grow. If it's too low, you're going to have some bacteria and viruses that are going to have the ability to thrive. We typically like to keep it in an optimum zone, and it is, again, based on relative humidity. Typically, when we're talking about comfort, we'll actually talk about absolute humidity, but it's actually relative humidity that really is affecting the, uh, the growth of things in the space. 
And if we're going to be focused on a healthy environment, we need to make sure, we, again, we keep back into this zone. So these are some of the key features that we've got to be thinking of as we design um, air conditioning systems for that health. We've got to have people who are comfortable. We've got to have good indoor uh, air quality, good ventilation requirements. And again, we've got to maintain that humidity control. Finally, we need to talk about energy efficiency. So again, one of the core principles, energy efficiency, um, we have a minimum requirement uh, in, this, in this country. Uh, the Energy Policy Act of 1992 adopted ASHRAE standard, ANSI ASHRAE standard 90.1, and it's considered the minimum code requirement for energy in commercial buildings. There's an equivalent one in the residential side as well. But beyond minimum code, there's a ton of other references as well. ASHRAE publishes one called 189.1. Um, there's also Advanced Energy Design Guides. This was a partnership between the Department of Energy, um, IES, and ASHRAE, uh, and the U.S. Green Building Council, to name a few, um, that really looks at how do we beat 90.1, and can we give people the steps to do that? And ASHRAE released a number of them um, at 30% better than 90.1, 50%, and now we're working on buildings that can be ready for zero energy. So the zero energy requirement. And if we put all those pieces together, now we can start looking at what kind of air conditioning systems meet these requirements, what are the concerns, and where do we go for, go for forward from here. So let's look at some common HVAC systems, particularly for some small commercial spaces. The first one, and this is the common one that you see there, they're sold as um, small. You see them on many of your big box retail stores, the very large ones, VAV rooftop systems, variable air volume rooftop systems. And there's a few derivations on this, but this is kind of the core principle behind them. And what you can see on the air conditioning system here, let's see if I can grab a pen, little mark here. This is what there we go. This is what would be considered the VAV rooftop all encompassed in here. And it would be considered one whole system. And if I start here, you can see what you have is you have return air coming from the space. Some of that is being exhausted to the outside. Some of it's coming back down here, mixing with some outdoor air, going through a heating and cooling coil, through a fan, and supplied out to each of the individual spaces. Each of the individual spaces is controlled with a VAV box, and that's attached to a temperature thermostat in the space. And this box is going to open and close depending on the needs of the space. There will be a minimum set point of that space, and that's because these diffusers in the space need a certain amount of air volume in order to actually function. You can get into the full details of, of how air, we'll call them uh, air diffusers work, because if they don't have enough air volume, the air will only come up and be on the ceiling of the space. Or if they have too much air volume, sometimes in, depending on the temperatures of the space, they'll be dumping in the space. And I know you've known that feeling too. You've been under one of those in a space and it's been, it's been dumping on you and you're like, oh, I'm too cold or I'm too hot, depending on the temperature it's applying. So having a good effect of these diffusers is highly dependent on the amount of air volume going through this VAV box. And so what we typically do is we have a minimum set point to make sure that these, these systems, these duct systems work effectively. Measuring the duct static in both the supply and the return are the VFDs for the air handler itself, and it could be a rooftop unit or an air handler. And depending if the boxes here start to close because these loads are satisfied, and this, this unit has the ability to close, then these VFDs will back off and these fans will slow down. If there's more air needed in these spaces, these boxes will open, and as a result, um, these VFDs will ramp up to supply that air to the space based, again, on the uh, static pressure across this duct. So the good thing about this system is it's fairly simple. It's very common in the industry. Um, you only need to supply out of the the system here, the amount of air required for each of the spaces. Um, we do allow for diversity, and I'm going to go into a detailed explanation of that in a minute. 
But what that essentially means is if this one needs more than this one, I can push more of the air over here versus over here or vice versa. And that it does allow me to reduce my duct or fan sizes, allowing for more energy efficiency. It's very easy to add economizers to the system, whether it be air side economizers or water side economizers. In this particular case, most of the time, what we would do is we design this outdoor air for the full air volume of this space. So if you have a nice cool temperature day like Minneapolis is experiencing today, you'd be able to use 100% outdoor air coming into the space as opposed to any of the return air. And that's because we would measure between the temperature of the return air or the enthalpy of the return air versus the enthalpy of the outdoor air and determine which air makes sense or how much to mix these ratios to supply the right temperature and humidity to the space. The good news is, is this system can also supply the minimum outdoor air. Therefore, I don't need to bring a dedicated outdoor air system to this space. So I do have the ability um, to bring my outdoor air in here and I don't have to buy another piece of equipment. So now let's look at some of the, the, the things that are, aren't as great about this system. Um, because I am bringing outdoor air into this common system here, um, I have to guess as to how much actually ends up in this space versus this space. And so as a result, it might be difficult to maintain that minimum outdoor air in each of my zones. I do require large duct shafts. If we look at how it, uh, the energy efficiency of moving heat conditioning around a building, the same amount of energy in about a three-eighths inch refrigerant pipe, two-inch water pipe, 42 inch duct. So if you're a building architect, you have to account for, if you're using an air side system to be cooling the space, where are those ducts going to go? How long are those duct runs going to be? Keeping in mind, the longer they are, the more static pressure, the more fan power you're going to need. So if we're talking about energy efficiency, duct work and the amount of duct work, or whether you're even using duct or a hydronic system or a uh, refrigerant based system, you really have to make all those considerations. Um, you do end up having some reheat on that VAV box once that minimum outdoor air volume is reached in the space. So remember, we can't turn the, the, the VAV box down too low or the air distribution system isn't going to work. As a result, we might end up overcooling the space unless we provide some kind of reheat. If we can reclaim the reheat, that's a great way to do it. If we can't, then we're going to have some energy inefficiency there. Um, and quite frankly, some of the cooler climates, if we're talking in uh, northern climates like northern Minnesota, maybe in Canada, um, some of those distributed heating systems are probably going to need, um, or uh, we're going to need some extra heat in the system than this VAV system can provide. And that might be some, some radiant systems on the walls. It might be a radiant flooring system. Um, there might be a different way that we have to look at doing that. So let's talk about diversity, because diversity applies to a couple of systems, particularly the VAV system. So if we look at this building, and this building here is pointing north, and look at the east side of the building over here versus the west side, if we look at it at 10 a.m. in the morning, as the sun is likely to be shining on this side of the building, it's facing east through this glass, that solar load is going to be quite high. And as a result, this east side of the building is probably going to peak before the west side. And then if we consider when the west side is peaking, it's probably peaking in the afternoon, just focusing on air volume right now in terms of CFM. But if I compare that, that peak on the west side to what that peak is in the afternoon for the east side, I'm only looking at 800 plus 1,200 in the six different spaces here. And as a result, I'm only looking at 6,000 CFM. But if I had decided that if I didn't have that ability to ramp down the VFD and move these little VAV boxes, I would have to size the air conditioning system and the air ventilation system for 1,200 for this space, 1,200 for this space, and it would actually be times six spaces, 7,200 CFM. So as you can see in this particular case, because I have a variable air volume system, I can actually get a diversity of 83%, which means my system only has to be sized for 83% of each of the individual peak loads. And as we go through a couple of these other systems, going to be wanting to look for, does that diversity exist and where does it exist? Diversity in this particular case on an air side system applies to the air side of the product. 
but if you're looking at a hydronic system, the diversity might be on the hydronic side of the system. So there are definitely areas you want to look at from a diversity perspective. So let's look at another system. Another very common system for commercial buildings is variable refrigerant flow systems, VRF systems is what we typically call them. So they have a, a compressor bearing unit, a, a condensing unit, if you will, and they often serve by a number of different pipes, okay, out into the individual spaces. And sometimes it's maybe a little bit easier to see it in here. And one of the best things about this system is they have the ability to provide heating and cooling and yet still only use one condensing unit heat pump type system. And what that does is they're able to take the heating off the system and provide it to one system that's in heating and take the cooling off the system and provide it to the other system. And they do that because they're doing a heat recovery in the middle of the cycle and saying, oh, you have sent refrigerant off to this space and as a result, that space needed cooling. The heat is now locked into that refrigerant. And now my refrigerant, instead of going all the way back to this condensing unit here, have the ability to do um, a heat recovery here, okay? And now I can send that warm refrigerant out to the space that needs it, and it doesn't even have to come all the way back to the compressor unit here. So one of, again, one of the benefits are you have a, a three-pipe system, and a couple of manufacturers do it a little bit differently, so everyone has their own way of doing it. The principles are really the same, and that is I can move the heat that is being generated in these spaces, these look like meeting room spaces here, and I can recover it, and I can supply it into an office space that needs a little bit more heating. And if I look at the overall system, I'm able to recover it. And now if I think about my, my energy efficiency, remember we have my 3 8 refrigerant, two inches of a hydronic, and 42 inches of duct, and I'm an architect, I have a lot less space that has to be taken up for mechanical equipment. So again, one of the great advantages of this system. So it's great for retrofit applications because I don't have to kind of pull down the whole wall. I do get zone control because I put an individual unit in every space and it can get either heating or cooling. Um, it's high efficiency because I, I, the only ear I'm required to do is just recirculating. I'll go back one slide here. I'm just recirculating the air just in the space right here. Um, I get uh, advanced energy or efficiency on the compressors because I'm only having to do it uh, for the delta of the heating load because I'm able to recover the energy uh, from each of the individual spaces and I only have to either provide additional cooling or additional heating based on the offset. Um, ventilation air has to be taken care of directly. So the system, because it is using refrigerant to go through each of the different systems, if I need outdoor air into each space, and we do, um, we will have to do that with a separate system. It won't be tied to the system. So we would add another dedicated outdoor air system onto here, provide that directly into the space. And so now we know we're getting the exact amount of ventilation for each space because it is a dedicated amount of outdoor air to each space. This is a refrigerant-based system, so I do have to run refrigerant lines throughout the entire building. Um, that means there is a fair bit of refrigerant in the building, and it also means they tend to run through occupied spaces. They're probably in ceilings and in corridors in between occupied spaces, but again, they are exposed to occupants versus in many cases, they're either on the roof or they're in a mechanical room, usually away from many occupied spaces. There are maximum piping runs that are allowed by the system. All refrigerant-based systems do have used compressors. Compressors have oil in them. Um, that's to make sure that the compressors keep running. And the reason we have maximum refrigerant piping runs is because we have to make sure we maintain that oil and that oil comes back to the compressor. It's embedded in the refrigerant. We have to make sure we get enough of it back. As a result, um, every manufacturer of these systems will tell you we have a maximum height and a maximum equivalent length that we can um, have for the system. So you might, in a tall building like this, you might have to divide it up into multiple spaces uh, to get over that maximum height. And again, now we have a separate system for ventilation. The benefit is we get ventilation directly to the space, but in terms of it being a separate system for ventilation, it's another piece of equipment to buy. Let's look at one other system. This is a, another air side and hydronic system, so fan coils or air handlers and chillers. And very similar to the 
uh, I'll call it a combination between the, the VRF and the, and the VAV system. We now have a air handler that can serve each of the spaces and provide that air to the space and cooling, sensible or latent. And then we have the hydronic system so that we have um, the ability to get that cooling to it. Um, it's again very efficient from a fan perspective because each of these air handlers are just managing the load in their space and so it's a very small amount of static energy and therefore very low fan power. We do get ventilation delivered directly to the space because we will need a dedicated outdoor air system to make sure that that happens. And so that's great, it'll go directly to the space, which means we can make sure that they have that exposure to a healthy um, ventilation air. Um, it's fairly easy to design and control. If you have a four pipe system and you have heating and cooling pipes, each of the coils get both um, hot and cold water. And as a result, they have the ability to provide heating and cooling to the space. And in this place, remember we were talking about diversity, the chiller in this case has the diversity. So each fan coil or each air handler to every zone has to be sized for that maximum air volume. So we don't get the diversity on the air side, but we do get the diversity on the, uh, the chiller plant size. Um, you do have a unit inside the space. So this is, you've seen this very commonly, if for example, in a hotel room, uh, you'll see that is, it is in the occupied space that may cause noise concerns or serviceability issues. Um, and again, a dedicated ventilation system is required, so again, we're going to have to buy another piece of equipment. And we're going to have to control it with all of these other pieces in the puzzle. So again, the benefit is we're getting that outdoor air to the space, we're getting the right amount to the space, um, but we're having to buy another piece of equipment. We've been talking about all these dedicated outdoor air systems that fall into these common systems. Let's talk a little bit about what those systems look like. So here's a couple of different systems using um, exhaust air energy recovery. Probably the most common way to um, provide outdoor air to the space is using energy recovery using either a wheel or, or a plate and frame. And what we have here is we have some exhaust air coming and uh, being exhausted from the building. You're seeing this is a wheel in this particular case. And that wheel slowly rotates. So if there's warm air, We'll use the winter condition here. There's warm air on the exhaust air or return air side. That warm air is heating up the wheel. And as that wheel rotates around here, cool outdoor air that's coming in is preheated by, by the wheel before it goes through either a cooling or heating coil and then ventilation air to the space. In the case of a summer requirement, this air that's coming through here is, we'll call it 72 degrees and 50% relative humidity. And this outdoor air might be you know, 95 degrees and 60% and relative humidity. So it's quite warm and quite humid. And again, that heat from there is transferred back to the exhaust stream and the coolness that's coming from the return air is transferred to the, well, heat only moves in one direction, coolness is that actually transferred. But the heat from the outdoor air is transferred to the exhaust air, which means it's getting a pre-cooling effect before it hits a cooling coil. Again, making this entire unit quite efficient. I was actually with a customer, we did this on a 150 ton system um, just last week, and we were just, we did the first stage of cooling, which was the energy recovery wheel, and the entire system only used nine watts of cooling before we turned on the, the rest of the uh, cooling system. And the, the customers were really quite a, um, a fan with how much cooling they got, um, trying to cool down a space that was uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 88 degree dew point. Um, and they got quite a bit of cooling just coming off uh, on the wheel. This is another one here. You have a, a plate and frame here. So what you have, the difference here is that you have a wheel here and the air is going through the wheel. These are going through a set of fins and these air streams do not mix at all. So this air stream goes through one set of fins that only point in one direction. This goes through a cross set of, of fins and they don't mix at all. And this is particularly important if you're in a type of scenario where you cannot mix the exhaust air stream with the incoming air. Although in wheels very little air does go between them, one of the cons to a wheel environment is that occasionally um, there is a, a small percentage of air, a few CFM that might go through, and there may be cases where it doesn't make sense. 
In this case, again, the energy is exchanged between the exhaust air and the outdoor air, or vice versa, depending on where the heat is blowing, before going through a heat cooling or heating coil and providing ventilation air to the space. Um, this system is a little more complex. Um, it has a, both an energy recovery wheel and, again, a sensible um, cross-flow heat exchanger here. And so what you have here is you have your outdoor air changing with your exhaust stream. Okay, so your exhaust stream is coming through here, going through this, this plate, then going through the energy recovery wheel before it's being exhausted. Your outdoor air is going through that, then a cooling coil, and then going through your cross-heat exchanger. It could be ventilation air. So what you have here is the first stage is actually cooling this outdoor air, further, further cooling if needed by that cooling coil, and then actually a little bit of reheat, sensible reheat coming off that exhaust air stream. And the benefit of that is one of the things we want to do when we provide that ventilation to the, to the whether it be a fan coil or air handlers and chillers, um, whether it be our VRF system, whether it even be a water source heat pump system, which we didn't even talk about, but when you're providing that dedicated outdoor air, you want net neutral air being coming into the space. Similar space temperature, 50% RH, you want net neutral air coming into the space because you don't want it to add to the heating or cooling load of your system, whether it be your fan coils or your VRF system. So the benefit of doing the dedicated outdoor air system is you have a very simply simple uh, ventilation control. It's one system that you have to worry about. You do get that ventilation air directly to your space occupants. Um, you can improve humidity control because each of your terminal units in the space, they're dealing with the sensible load in the space, the humans, the, the, the computers, the lights, everything in the space. And this system is designing the ventilation load, which is really focused on that humidity con uh, control or humidity requirements for the outdoor air. And because your terminal units are only dealing with sensible load, they can actually be a lot smaller. Um, it is another piece of equipment to install, maintain, control, change the filters on, clean, um, and it will require some ductwork. But again, that ductwork is a lot smaller because now I don't have my entire cooling load in the ductwork. I just have the cooling load in the ventilation air. And so it's really your minimum air volumes. Let's talk about how we actually get that air into the space. And there's many different um, ways to do it, and everyone has their own different way of doing it. I often joke that if you get 30 engineers in a room, you get, you know, 100 opinions. Um, but if we have the uh, outdoor air coming in, a couple of different ways. It could go into your terminal unit, the back side of it, and mix with that return air and deliver it to the space. It could come directly into the space, and there you can see your, your terminal unit is right here. Um, or, again, it could come directly into the space, and maybe your terminal unit is not even located nearby its uh, hydronic system or it, it's down on the floor over here. Um, what we do recommend is you have some kind of air modulating dampers for that airflow control, and then you're monitoring your space to see whether you need that ventilation air or not. Typical way to measure that is using CO2 sensors and measuring and, and including that ventilation air or not, or how much ventilation air you need based on the load in the space. All about the energy efficiency of the system. We look at the energy efficiency of every individual component. Um, we're going to struggle because one energy efficiency payoff may hurt another one. In this particular case, we're trying to look at the entire system and bring it all together. And so this one is a measure the outdoor air and, and bring in as much as necessary. So let me turn over to some of the kind of common issues that I see that they plague building owners, they plague manufacturers, things that we can all work on. I'm going to start with fan energy efficiency. If we're talking about air distribution systems, we really need to be talking about one of the primary components of that being fan energy efficiency. So we talked about the VAV system, and we said one of the problems with it is I have to, I have to be able to turn it down because maybe my space doesn't need as much cooling load as, as, as it's designed for at its max cooling load, curling requirement. So if I look at that, I need a fan that has the ability to turn around, turn down. We talked about the, the diffusers needing to be able to turn down as well, right, because we have a minimum set point. So there's two areas where turn down is going to be key. On the diffusers, we want to make sure that when the air comes through the diffusers, it's actually mixing with the space and providing the cooling that the occupants are looking for. On the fan, if you look at a fan curve, fans have the certain fans, depending on which fan you choose, 
have the ability to turn down, but then they often get to a point where they're going to hit surge. And we have to avoid surge. You've, you may or may not have been to a building, but I've been in many buildings where, where fans have hit surge, and that's that whoomp, whoomp, whoomp noise you hear. And that means the fan isn't acting effectively. It's not actually changing that, um, that air coming in into a velocity pressure that can be delivered to the space. It's really just feeding on itself. As a result, being able to look at where that fan is, having it to be able to turn down efficiently so that you can operate throughout the entire envelope of the entire year, that would be a key area to focus on. The fan itself has its efficiency, the motor has another efficiency point. And again, motor efficiency today, although it gets better every year, it increments this little chunk every year. Getting that to be highly efficient at all operating points, at all operating temperatures, would be a key feature that would, again, help the industry. And if you're looking at the entire system, we have to look at how many hours and what size of fan are needed. One of the things that's changed in the industry in, I'll call it the last 10 years, people have said, I want to go away from the really big fans that we used to use, and I want to go to a lot more smaller fans. Well, the smaller fans actually change what that envelope looks like in terms of what operating parameters they run at, what motor efficiency they get, and what fan efficiency they get. And so you really want to take a look at how many hours is the system running and what size of fans make a lot more sense, keeping in account the fact that there's the cost and the space availability um, to each of these. Any time we can remove space away from mechanical equipment, it can be turned into useful space, whether it be leasable space or usable space for a building occupant. Humidity control. In order to have a healthy environment, we absolutely need to focus on humidity control, whether it be controlling it for the building occupants in terms of comfort or controlling it for the, the healthiness of the building, making sure that we don't have any kind of growth in the environment. Those are two kind of key areas as well. And then the last piece we need to look at is what, is what are we doing to make sure that minimum outdoor air actually reaches each space or occupant? We not only have to get it into the space, we have to, have to make sure it's mixing with the space. We have to make sure the diffusers are being effective, but we also have to make sure that minimum outdoor air, whether it be coming through a central system or a dedicated system, is actually getting to the occupants in the space. And the last piece that I'm going to talk about is sustainable products. How long will they last? I often see with me, you know, I have a lot of customers that come to us and they say, you know, I don't want something that I'm going to be retrofitting in 10 years. I want it to last the life of my building. And so whether that means we're testing it to a different ability, um, we're, we're designing for the future, whether we're building it out of materials that last, how long is it going to last is obviously a key customer that building owners have. All right, um, just covering what we talked about today, um, we have an introduction to some kind of common systems today, the pros and cons of each of them. Um, no one system is perfect, at least I haven't seen them yet in my years in the industry. Um, there's definitely some pros and cons of each, and as you're looking at designing a healthy and efficient air distribution system, I think you're going to want to take all those pieces into account. Um, talked about some building ventilation systems, some common issues that plague building owners. Um, and my question to everyone today is, what are you going to do differently? What, what, what ideas do you guys have? Um, last but not least, I provided a couple of resources. Um, if you want to follow up on some of the stuff that we've talked about today, um, you can do some read-only versions of any of those ASHRAE standards we talked about. Um, they are listed here. Um, the IEQ design guide is something you can look at as well. And then the free downloads for the advanced energy design guides. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa and see if we have any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Carol. That was an excellent presentation. So, Dennis, if you could open up the lines, we will see if we have any questions. I see we have – we don't have any technical questions in the chat box, but I'll open it up. Does anyone have a question for – me on the Jump into STEM program or for Carol on this challenge? Uh, 
Everything is unmuted, ma'am. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. I well, I encourage you. Uh, oh, yes. On one of Carol's slides, where um, some resources was being shown, I saw the one for the Advanced Energy Design Guide for K through 12 school building. Uh, from guidance point of view, is it as a result of the functionality of those spaces in terms of the occupant when you look at the uh, comfort level? Uh, compare with, I'm just thinking of the college level students in terms of university for the building type. Uh, what is the variation in terms of how you design for the HVAC system in terms of the looking at the energy, indoor air quality and the comfort system? Will that building type for the K-12 school building be different from that of uh, a higher institution like a college level student? Is it as a result of the age of the occupants? What are the variants that is being looked at? Carol, is that well, something you can address? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll try. I was I was on the committee that wrote that, and I think if I understand your question correctly, I think you're asking what you know. What was it specifically about that guide that got it to zero energy versus um, other guides? And was it the type of students and the um, uh, the type of building? It, it, that, that's what we're addressing. Then I would say this: the we we. We built our, our mock-up systems based on the um, based on the K through 12, and there were definitely some considerations that were unique to K through 12 than there were for other buildings. So um, the thing that I think was unique about the K through 12 is that the um, the recommendation in the guide, and the guide is all about recommendations, and there's many different choices. But the recommendation was to include the energy efficiency, sustainability, the zero energy concept into the curriculum of the school. So that not only were we um, having a school that was zero energy, but we were also teaching the next generation about thinking about how to achieve zero energy. And I think that was one of the things that for me during when we wrote that guide was a key principle. Um, but I think, Every time we go through one of these guides, there's always a key parameter that we say is unique to this building that you absolutely have to take into account. So uh, on the K through 12 schools, you have, um, I'll just focus on the mechanical systems. On the mechanical systems, you have kitchen ventilation equipment that has to be taken account for um, based on the fact that it is a school versus Many other building types don't have a, a large kitchen ventilation. You also have zones that are things like um, reading rooms, libraries, gymnasiums that ha are big meeting spaces, and they have many hours of unoccupancy and many hours of high occupancy. And your HVAC system has to have the ability to ramp up and ramp back down very, very quickly in order to achieve that energy efficiency. But all of these guides for zero energy, we try to get them to the lowest EUI, and then we have them offset them by photovoltaics. Okay. Schools, as an example, because they tend to be fairly low, they're not high-rise buildings, they have a lot of roof or um, space to be able to put in photovoltaics or other types of energy recover uh, uh, electricity generating systems, wind, solar power. Um, but um, if you compare that to uh, when we've written other zero energy buildings that might have a building as a high rise in New York City, now your availability to do um, energy generation at the site is much, more, much, much more difficult. So yes, every building has its unique features and we yes. do try and account for that in the school. But I don't believe that any building 
can't be zero energy. I think it just takes the creativity of the design team to be able to do it and do it well. And I think if you look at the number of guys we've produced, I think you see that that opportunity is really starting to come to fruition. Yes, thank you very much. I was just kind of curious uh, whether is the occupancy that accounted in terms of the uh, activity and some of the young ones in those spaces and things, uh, whether <laughs> the same VAC can be adaptive to the user of the space in a way. When I look at the grocery store, for example, just like those uh, high volume units that are in there, the in and out system, the intake and the output take in the vegetable area is going to be absorbing some of the things coming from that. And then when you're talking of hair quality in those larger grocery space, whether some of it, uh, the control system can be able to filter out uh, contaminants and things like that in a larger space. And then when we begin to think of a smaller space like a university environment, a classroom environment, uh, we regulate all those type of uh, variation in a way. But you've already answered the, the first one that I have in mind. Thank you very much. Okay, Good. thank you. So we have time for just one more question, if there's one out there. Okay, and if, if, uh, if not, I encourage you to go to our website at jump.ideascale.com. If you have a question, no. you can... Melissa, Can there's a it? question in the chat box. Oh, great. What does it say, Kim? Uh, in the DOAS, is there a heating coil in addition to a cooling coil? And if not, why not? Um, there can be. It depends on where your DOAS is located. If you are in a heating-dominated climate, you probably would include a heating coil. But if you had a DOAS system, um, the energy recovery wheel will probably take care of most of your heating requirements, in which case you probably wouldn't have a heating coil. You may also have, instead of a heating coil, you may have um, a, uh, a hot water coil. It might be a heat, hot water coil. It might be hot gas reheat off the condenser if it's done some cooling. And you may also do it as a gas furnace. DOAS systems usually have heating elements as well. But in a place like Georgia, uh, Missouri, Kansas, they may not, they may not, they may decide they don't, they don't need it. They may have a small enough heating load that the uh, recovery system is able to do it without it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you, Carol, for the response. I want to thank everyone for presenting, for participating today and especially thank Carol for her wonderful presentation and it will be posted on our website within a few days. Feel free to uh, visit our website, and if you have additional questions, you can email us at jump at ornl.gov. So with that, we're going to end the webinar, and again, thank you for your time today. We hope you, you submit much. some ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis, if you can end.